<laughs> Number 32. Number 32. I will call upon the Lord.
most kind and loving, merciful, mighty, powerful God. Indeed, help us to open our eyes so that we may see all of what wonderful gifts we have from you, what amazing love you have shown us, what glory and might and power you demonstrate for us every day, what concern you have for us. But Father, so often we take our eyes off of you, we are distracted by the wind and the waves. We lose sight of you. We lose our focus. We fear the things that go on around us in this world, the turmoil that besets us in our lives, the illness that hurts us so badly, the pain that comes our way. Father, open our eyes. Keep us focused on your Son, Jesus. Help our unbelief. Help our faith remain strong in you. When times of trial come upon us, help us to rely on you, to know that you are with us, to know that your warm and powerful arm is wrapped around us to know that we can receive comfort even in the most trying of times. Father, when joy does come our way and peace comes our way, help us to be still and to know that you are God, that everything is in your power and under your control. Help us to find comfort in one another. Help us to encourage and strengthen and build up one another as we come together here. <coughs> as we assemble together in Christian fellowship this morning around this table that reminds us of the sacrifice of your son Jesus. Without his blood, without his body being broken upon the cross, we have no hope of eternal salvation. It is only through that sacrifice that we can know your love, that we can rest assured in a home with you in heaven. Father, help us to be willing to share what we know about you and about your son Jesus with everyone. Every person we come in contact with needs to know about the great love you have for us. So many people, Father, are led astray by the adversary. Satan uses all kinds of tools against us. His weapons and his armory are replete with everything that he can turn and use against us, our own minds he uses. Help us to maintain that focus in the storms of life and to look directly into the eyes of your son Jesus and remember him Father God, we are so thankful for this congregation. We're so thankful for the leaders here. We're so, so thankful for this great nation of ours and the place we have what we call home and the beauty that surrounds us, declaring your majesty every day to us. <coughs> Father God, we ask that you will continue to be with us as we go on through this service this day and all through our lives. In the end, Father, we've been found faithful, we ask for a home with you in heaven. As I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The first reading this morning will come from the Numbers, reading in chapter 13, verse 26. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community in Kadesh, in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land which he sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. For the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Medea. The Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites live in the Kill country, 
and the Canaanites lived near the sea along the Jordan. And Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We can't attack these people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, The land we explored devours those living in it. And all the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there. We seen like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked to them. We looked the same to them. That night, all the people of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites stumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt, or in this desert, why is the Lord bringing us to this land, only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken to splendor. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, We should choose a leader in the right age. Number 304. Number 304. This morning we'll sing the first verse of this song to help us prepare our minds. Take on the Lord's so. Supper. 304. Once I was straying in sin's over valley, no hope within.
He promised them that he was going to take them to a new land and deliver that land into their hands. And yet, in spite of all of those wonderful promises, in spite of all the things they saw, the ten plagues on Egypt, the miraculous crossing of the Red Sea, and the destruction of Pharaoh's army, the actual hearing of God speak to them from Mount Sinai, in spite of all of these things, Israel stopped their own progress. I think the expression we use today is they shot themselves in the foot. Here they had God leading them to a promised land and they didn't make it. Do you realize of everyone that left Egypt over the age of 20, two, two entered the land of Canaan. They stopped themselves in their progress forward. Well, guess what? As individuals, you and I can stop our spiritual progress in the very same ways they did. And in the congregation of God's people, we can stop our progress in the very way that they did. And so, as Paul tells us in Romans 15, the things that were written before time were written for our learning. We need to learn. So let's see the four things that Israel did to stop themselves. Make sure we don't make those same mistakes either as individuals or as a church. First off was disbelief stopped them. Just pure disbelief. God said, I'm going to deliver you. I'm going to give you the land. And yet Hebrews 3 and verse 19 tells us, so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Alex read for us this morning out of the book of Numbers where literally their disbelief stopped them. You know, isn't it easier to listen to a larger group of people than it is a smaller group. You had ten saying, oh, there are giants in that land. Oh, we look like grasshoppers. Oh, woe is up. What about God? They forgot about God. Those ten totally left God out of the equation. And so the people are out there Oh, woe is us. God just brought us out here to die in the desert. It would been better that we died in Egypt. Let's get a new leader and go back. They did not believe Almighty God. Couldn't take God in His word. Psalm 78 verse 32 tells us about them. In spite of this, they still sinned and did not believe in his wondrous works. Ten plagues crossing the Red Sea, seeing the Egyptians destroyed, manna, quail, water from rocks, and yet they didn't believe. They didn't trust God. You know, when I read these things, it's kind of, what would it have taken to penetrate the hands of these hard-headed people? All of these things God did for them, and they still didn't believe. Do you realize that when they finally got in and took Jericho, a totally unique thing happened in all the history of the world. One time, a one time of then, a battle was fought where one side had absolutely no casualties whatsoever. By the way, for those of you who don't know, there was a battle almost that complete. 
when George Washington took the Hessian troops to Trenton, he had one man injured. But that's as close as we ever got. No one died. But they in the wilderness didn't believe that. And so Hebrews chapter 10, 39 gives us as Christians in the church a warning. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition. That's what they want to do, go back to Egypt. But of those who believe to the saving of the Son, we keep believing God. We keep trusting God. We don't let disbelief stop us. But secondly, they rebelled and therefore stopped their process. Hebrews 3 and verse 16. For who, having heard, rebelled? God had said, I am going to give you the land. And then when God started punishing the unfaithful messengers, oh, well, we'll go take the land. And God said, ah, you've already missed the opportunity now. You're not going in there. So some of them marched over the hill and were never heard from again. So they actually balked and rebelled against God. Deuteronomy chapter 9 and verse 24, Moses makes an interesting statement. You have been rebellious against the Lord your God from the day that I knew you. Wow. What a comment. What an accusation. But read Exodus numbers. And guess what? Moses wasn't exaggerating at all. Everything that came down the pike for them, somebody rebelled against God. They thought they knew better than God. And so... They wanted to do things their way instead of God's way. Psalm 78, verse 17. But they sinned even more against Him by rebelling against the Most High in the wilderness. God had proved He was the Most High. Do you not realize all ten plagues attacked something the Egyptians worshipped? Read the first parts of the book of Exodus, even in the context of chapter 6, when Moses first goes to the Israelite people, God said, you will know that I am the Lord your God. And he also said, the Egyptians are going to know I'm the Lord your God. And I'm not sure some of the Egyptians were more faithful to God at the end of that process than the Israelites were. They rebelled against God. It was just like God was trying to pull them along and they just dug the heel of their shoes into the ground and they weren't going anywhere. We're not careful we can do that ourselves today. Hebrews 10 and verse 26 warns us, for if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. Sometimes we, we're not careful. I know God doesn't want me to do that, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to do what I want. God can take me or leave me. Now, I'll tell you what, folks. Anytime we come up with that attitude, God can take us or leave us, guess what? We're going to get left. So He doesn't have to have us. He doesn't need us. We need Him. And so when we start getting this rebellious attitude, I'm going to do what I want to do. Whoa. We are about to fall into a world of trouble. So don't let that attitude become yours. Thirdly, stubbornness stopped Israel. Hebrews 3, 9. Where your fathers tested me, proved me, and saw my words for you. You know, 
pardon the word I'm about to use, but it's the only word I can use to describe that. Those were the gripingest bunch of people on earth. Everything was wrong for them. Nothing was good enough. Nothing was right. You know, there are some people probably you and I have met in life and if they had the opportunity to go to heaven, they probably find something wrong up there. They find something wrong with everything. And so they just get stuck. Back to Moses. Deuteronomy 9 and verse 6. For you are a stiff-necked people. Who? You know stubborn people? You know, as sweet and loving as I am now, what what I don't show a kind. Uh, when I was younger, I had a stubborn streak in me. I guess it's the Dutch. My mother said my ancestors probably trained beetles. They were actually quarrymen. I guess you've got to be about equal to stubborn. But sometimes people would come up to tell me, you will do this or you will not do that. And I would go rigid. Oh, I mean, I look like the proverbial steel line. Danny, a football coach, broke me of that. Because he was saying something. He said, boy, you better relax now or you're going to run from now on until the day of judgment. And so I relaxed in a hurry. Israel? No, they didn't. Psalm 78, eh? That they may not be like their fathers, a stubborn nation, a rebellious generation, a generation that did not set its heart aright. Nor was there a spirit of faithfulness to God. Ah, oh, that's where the stubbornness came in. They never got their hearts right. Maybe they were looking at God like some people in our world today look at God. That He's this overindulgent grandfather. No. When God brought them out, He expected certain things out of them. And sadly, He didn't follow through. They didn't produce. Hebrews 3.13, we're warned, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Sin has a way of hardening our hearts as well. Sin has a way of keeping our hearts from being aligned with the heart of God. And so we need to be really, really careful that we avoid such things. And finally, idolatry stopped Israel. Now let's remember, God spoke to them in Exodus chapter 19. At the mountain, they heard God's voice. Not just Moses. Everybody did. In fact, they were so terrified, you go up and talk to him because we're afraid we're going to die if he keeps talking to us. They heard the voice of God. They heard the giving of the Ten Commandments verbally. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make to you a graven image. <coughs> Again, 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 7. And do not become idolaters as some of them were. Moses goes up. Forty days he's in the mountain talking with God, getting instructions on the temple and their way of life, and what do they do? Build camp. Man. <laughs> Moses has hardly gone out of their sight and they're building a camp. Again, Deuteronomy 9, verse 16, And I looked in there, you had sinned against the Lord your God and made for yourselves a molten camp. Can you imagine Moses starting down after being with God for 40 days and then they are in the valley partying around the golden calf. Oh, I wonder if before he shattered the tables of stone, he was just sitting there shaking his head and thinking, what? What kind of 
kind of people are these? By the way, at this point, and at the point where they rebelled about going into the land, God was ready to do away with all of them and start over with Moses. <coughs> and both times, Moses begged God not to. Maybe once I might have done that. I think the second time I'd have backed up and said, have at it, let's start over. I'm tired of these people. Give me somebody else to deal with. Psalm 78, verse 50 says, they tested and provoked the most high God and did not keep his testimony. I don't and we today say, well, I don't worship some image. It may not be true. Anything, anything you put before God becomes your right. You may not bow down before it. You may not light incense before it. It may not be a gold or silver image that you have in the corner of your house or you go to a temple and worship, but anything that you let come before God is an idol to you. And we need to stay away from all idols. God's got to be number one. He's not going to settle for number two. It's not what He wants for us. Hebrews 10 and verse 35. The writer then warns us, Therefore do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. We don't serve them. We serve a living God. We don't serve a martyr. We serve a living saint. And our confidence is not in money or possessions or whatever people put their confidence in. Our confidence is in Jesus Christ. The one who came and gave himself for us. But the folks, let's not be together. Let's not stop ourselves in our progress in trying to serve God. Let's be people who serve them faithfully from a full heart as we follow His will and try to bring others to Him. Because maybe you're here today you've never become a Christian. You've never even gotten started. <coughs> well, first things first. You need to put on Christ. You need to believe on Him with all your heart and repent of your sins. You need to confess your faith in Him. Wash away those sins in the waters of baptism that you might put on Christ as He takes away your sin. Maybe you're here today and you stopped yourself from your sin. You're not headed toward heaven. You're not progressing anymore. You're stuck. Come back. Depend on the wrong you've done. Ask God's forgiveness. If you need to respond to the invitation today, won't you do so? And we stand. And the soul will you leave.